Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and in heaven, the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the testimony, was opened. Out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. The first angel went and poured out his bowl on the land, and ugly and painful sores broke out on the people who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his image. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it turned into blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs of water, and they became blood. Then I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, You are just in these judgments, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged. For they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. And I heard the altar respond, Yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and the sun was given power to scorch people with fire. They were seared by the intense heat, and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But they refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. Men gnawed their tongues in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to repent of what they had done. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs, and they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for for the battle on the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings together to the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Then there came flashes of lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on earth. So tremendous was the quake. The great city split into three parts, and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones of about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. And they cursed God on account of the plague of hail because the plague was so terrible. Amen. The word of the Lord. So, I've been trying to approach Revelation um, from the big picture and saying, if you, if you understand the basic structuring things that are going on, it's really not that hard to get what's happening in Revelation. I don't know if you guys are agreeing with that or how, how you guys feel about Revelation, where are we at, but I just want to give you a bit of a big picture reminder so that we can situate what we're doing right now in these, in these two chapters. And basically, 
Does anyone remember what the three sevens are in Revelation? The three main seven-fold items. The first, the seven seals. The second is the seven trumpets. And the third is the seven bowls, right? And today is the seven bowls. We talk about those. And so where we are in the context is we just had the last action sequence in the book was at the end of chapter 11, and that was the seventh trumpet. The seventh trumpet is hugely important in the book of Revelation and in the end times understanding of what's going on, what takes place in the seventh trumpet. And I'm not going to go back over that again, but I covered that in a lot of detail before. I hope that people are still remembering what that was about. And then there was this big interlude where a whole bunch of really important stuff was talked about in chapter 12, 13, and 14 about the war in heaven, the war with the dragon, and how the dragon raised up the beast, the Antichrist, and what was going on during that three and a half year period or 42 month period, all the things that are going on, the persecution of the saints by the Antichrist, the prophetic ministry of the two witnesses in Jerusalem, um, and other stuff is going on. There's a lot of crazy stuff happening. The mark of the beast is, the image of the beast is set up during this time period, People are being forced, if they don't worship the mark of the beast and receive, if they don't worship the image of the beast and receive the mark, uh, they can't buy or sell and they will be killed. Um, So there's a lot of really intense stuff going on. I might cover chapter 14 last week. And uh, I think chapter 14, at least the final few verses of chapter 14, are kind of like a summary of what's coming next. Mike was talking about the big uh, great judgment that's about to come. And in those last verses of chapter 14, the, the, the judgment of God is described as a wine press, okay, a, a, a massive wine press into which the grapes are thrown and then pressed down and, and trampled and their blood flows out. Uh, at, the blood flows out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for about 300 kilometer distance. And my, my take on that is that that's basically a summary of the judgment that's taking place in the bowls, okay? And so now we're getting into the bowls with chapter 15 and 16. And so it, it, it draws out in more detail what that massive final judgment of God on the Antichrist, on the Antichrist's kingdom, and on the city that's called Babylon, okay? Which those things are all related to each other. And it's God's final massive judgment on it. So as far as time frame goes, if we try to think about when do the bowl judgments take place time-wise, to me, the the most important time frame uh, thing that comes up in Revelation is that three and a half year period of time. There's three and a half year period where the Antichrist is given authority to to reign and to exercise his authority, his his authority that's been given to him by by the devil. And uh, during that period, two things are happening simultaneously. One is this massive persecution against the church. Okay, the Bible describes the Antichrist as waging war on the saints. Okay, and the false prophet and that whole system is, is operating. And then at the same time, I believe there is simultaneously happening uh, an amazing movement of, of prayer and prophecy in the church that's, I believe, is represented by those two witnesses that are basically exercising this awesome uh, prophetic ministry right in the midst of what the Antichrist is doing. So some people wonder about, like, what, what is the church going to be doing during this awful time when, when the trumpet judgments are being released? And remember, the trumpet judgments were, were partial judgments. They were warnings. Uh, that's why they're a trumpet. They're a warning and, but they only took out like a third of each of the areas that they were taking out. So it speaks that those are partial judgments. There's still room for repentance and, and there's warning going on. But I think the church will be doing um, some really powerful prayer and ministry. And I think that, that comes up again. We talked about that a little bit in the past uh, chapters, but it comes up again in this one today. Okay, and then at the end of that three and a half year period, that's when the seventh trumpet blows. And in a sense, the seventh trumpet contains the bowls, just like the seventh seal contained the trumpets. 
Now, if that doesn't make sense to you right now, you might need to go back and, and look that over again. But as far as the big structuring principle, that's what's going on, I think. And it's interesting because John speaks of this 1260-day period, which is, which is three and a half years if you're considering months of 30 days. But if you look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, which obviously John has in mind in a lot of what he's writing, he has in mind this prophetic end times prophecy in the book of Daniel. And the book of Daniel, when Daniel talks about from the time of the setting up of the abomination that causes desolation, which is the image of the beast, okay? From the time the image of the beast is set up, which is this image of the Antichrist, you know, in Jerusalem, in the temple, um, until the end, until the final end comes, Daniel says there will be 1290 days. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. So why is John talking about 1260 days and all these things take place and then Daniel talks about 1290 days? My thought on what makes sense here is that those 30 days are the time period when the bowl judgments are taking place. Because the seventh trumpet blows at the end of the three and a half year period. But then there's still the bowls that come after that. Now some people understand the bowls and the relation of the bowls and the trumpets in different ways. And I'm just telling you the thing that makes the most sense to me is to understand them as they seem to be presented as they happen, the bowls happen after the trumpets. The trumpet judgments are against the Antichrist. They're partial judgments. The bowl judgments are complete and thorough, final devastation and destruction of the Antichrist kingdom and all of its uh, manifestation on the earth. It's God's complete and final removing of evil and oppression from the earth. That's what's happening in the bowl judgments. And it's connected with Jesus coming. In my understanding of the end times events, Jesus has already appeared. He appears at the last trumpet. Other scriptures talk about that, about the the rapture happening and the saints meeting the Lord in the air as he comes down. And it also, Jesus talked about how he'll be, the sign of the Son of Man will be seen in the sky and all the eyes of people on the earth will see him. They'll see Jesus in the sky when he comes. And so he's kind of circulating in the sky Uh, That's how Jesus describes himself appearing when he talks about it. And when is that happening? I think it's at the seventh trumpet. But then Jesus is going to touch down to the earth and his holy ones are going to come with him. And I think that's when the bowl judgments are finally released. And Jesus ultimately marches up to Jerusalem and he, he basically blows on the Antichrist and the Antichrist is defeated. But more, more on that is, is to come later on. But that's just the big picture of what we're talking about here. The seventh trumpet, remember the seventh trumpet, the meaning of it was announced in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. And I think this is the key point of the whole book of Revelation. It says in Revelation eleven fifteen, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Jesus is taking up his rightful authority over the kingdoms of the earth, the authority that is due to him because he is worthy, because he gave his life, he shed his blood, he purchased people um, for God from every tribe and tongue and nation of the earth. And God is responding by exalting Jesus' name above every name and making him the king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And Jesus will actually come into that reign one day. And that is our hope as the church on the earth, that we look forward to this and we say, Lord, come. And and we see at the end of the book of Revelation, we see the church, the bride of Christ, crying out for Jesus to come. And anyway, so so that's the big picture, okay? So let's, let's get into the details here a little bit. John starts off saying, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them, the wrath of God is finished. And that just, to me, clearly states that the the bold judgments are the last judgments and they come after the other judgments. And just, I'm just saying some interpreters see that differently, but it seems quite clear to me that that's what's happening here. 
with these bold judgments, the wrath of God is completed. It's, it's finished. It comes to its purpose, to the end that it was, it was working for. Okay, so what happens? Then, then we get this, this picture. John sees what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. Think about a sea of glass mingled with fire. Like a sea, like the water of a sea, but it's like a sea of glass. But it's mingled with fire. Okay? This is the same, this is that great sea that's in front of the throne of God in heaven. God's throne room, when God's throne appears in the, in the pictures of it in the Old Testament, there's always this, this sea in front of his throne. This great expanse. Ezekiel chapter 1 verse 22, it talks about it as an expanse that's sparkling like ice. This is this glorious sea that's in front of God's throne. And back in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, we saw that this expanse was before God's throne, before the throne of God. And now John mentions, he didn't mention this before, but that the, the, the sea, the glass of the sea, the glassy waters of the sea are mingled with fire. And where is the fire coming from? I'm partly wondering. And because in front of God's throne, there are seven blazing torches which represent the Spirit of God. And, you know, from God's throne are emanating lightning, these blasts of lightning and this, this glorious light and, and fire is, is moving in front of God's throne. And I think what's happening is that when God is about to do something that is communicated out from his throne in these messages of, of sound and light and glory, and, and it bursts out through the, the entire sea, is filled with this, this light and glory of God as, as God's... And right now, God is ready for the final judgments. And that's why this fire, which in the Bible, often fire is associated with God's judgment. And it, it's flowing through the sea. Now, the saints are standing there. Um, the NIV says they're beside the sea of glass. Other translations say they're on the sea of glass. I kind of like the idea of them being beside the sea of glass. Because I think the sea of glass right now is maybe a bit of a dangerous place to be standing. Because it's mingled with all this fire of God's powerful judgment that's coming out. But anyway, we see them there standing. The NIV says, beside the sea of glass, they have harps of God in their hands. They are the ones who had conquered the beast. They conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. So this is really interesting because how did they conquer the beast? All of these saints, all these believers who were in the midst of this massive persecution of the Antichrist, how did they conquer him? Did they get together a big army and a bunch of tanks and kind of go in and take take out the Antichrist? No, they didn't. They totally didn't. Actually, other parts of the same scripture in Revelation say that he conquered them. He was waging war against the saints and conquering them. And it's actually the case that they conquered the Antichrist in being conquered by him. Okay? Because they refused to compromise. They refused to give in to the Antichrist. With this massive pressure that he was putting on people to compromise, to give in, to worship him, and to worship the dragon to worship Satan through worshiping him. But there was this this statue that that had been created, and and we saw last time time I preached given breath so that it had the power to kill people who who refused to worship it, people who refused to take the mark of the beast and to belong to him. But they conquered, the saints conquered him in the same way that they conquered the dragon earlier in Revelation. How did they conquer the dragon earlier? It says in Revelation 12 verse 11, they overcame him, same word, conquer, overcame, same, same word in Greek. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. In other words, they were faithful to Jesus Christ, even to the point of death, even when it meant death. They refused to turn against Jesus. And receiving the mark of the beast essentially is turning against Jesus because he is the Antichrist. If you're saying you belong to him, you belong to the Antichrist. 
If you take his mark, that's a symbol that you are offering yourself to now belong to him, body and soul. Okay? So, and what is the Antichrist doing? He's, he's blaspheming God. That's the essence of what he does. He stands and he utters these proud words and he sets himself up against God and everything else that is to be worshipped. And he blasphemes God and all the dwellers of heaven and, and God's dwelling place. So to take his mark is to participate with him and to agree with him. It essentially involves denying Christ. And so these saints are the ones who refuse to deny Christ. They stood their ground even, even to the point of death. And here they are standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. So they overcame. And that's the glory of what we know from God's revelation is that we can be killed in this life. Our bodies can be destroyed. But we will nevertheless be with God even after our bodies are destroyed. That God will keep our souls in his hand. And so we see that picture here, and it's this picture of hope because we see this massive persecution of what's happening, and now we see the result of it. The result is that the saints overcome him. They conquer him, and they are standing with God, and they are singing a song. They're, they're holding harps, and they're singing a song. And they sing this song that's called the Song of Moses, the servant of God. But it's also called the Song of the Lamb. And so a lot of the things that are going on here Bring us back to Exodus. Because in Exodus, the song of Moses was the song that the Israelites sang after God took them through the Red Sea. God brought his people out of slavery. He delivered them from Egypt. He redeemed them. And all of Pharaoh and his armies were pursuing him, pursuing the people of God. And those armies were then drowned in the Red Sea and the God's people came out on the other side and they, and they were safe and preserved by God. And the redeemed people of God in Exodus stood beside the sea and they sang the song of Moses to God and they praised God. And so that's the same thing that these saints in the future ultimate fulfillment of Exodus, of the, the massive, the great redemption of God that's coming in the day of God they, they stood their ground and they came out on the other side and they sang this song. This song, it's not only the song of Moses, but it's also the song of the Lamb who is the greater Moses, the fulfillment of, of everything that Moses was about. And let's, let's analyze their lyrics. Do you guys like to analyze lyrics when you listen to songs? So I, I can't really help doing that. And I know that annoys other people sometimes, but I can't really get around it. I can't just kind of like bop to the song and ignore what the lyrics are about. Like, there's the song the other day that was really driving me nuts. I'm like, what is this song about? It's the song by, you know that song, What About Us by Pink? Anybody know that song, What About Us? Yeah. It's like, I was like, what is that song about? It was driving me crazy. I kept hearing it. And so I had to like look into it and analyze the lyrics and figure out what was going on. And it's like an ode to Donald Trump, I guess. That's ultimately what it is, but not a, not a nice ode to Donald Trump. <laughs> anyway. But this song, so let's, let's look at the lyrics, okay? Let's, can we analyze the lyrics? I know that kind of takes away a little bit from it, so I won't do too much here. But here's the song. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. So this is basically a song of praise. It's a song of praise to God, where these redeemed saints are singing, and they're singing about God's deeds. They recognize his deeds are great and marvelous and amazing. And they, then they talk about his ways, which his ways aren't really that distinct from his deeds, but it's the way that he does things. The ways of God are just and true. And that's what, they, that's what they give God praise for. And then they declare out, who will not fear? It's a, it's a rhetorical question. It's saying, you are worthy to be feared and to be give, to, for your name to be glorified by all people. You are worthy, our God to be feared. Why? For you alone are holy. And that word holy 
we know it means set apart. It means that God is unlike anyone else, that God's ways are so just and true and perfectly good that he is unlike anyone else. There is no one else like God. The person who we know, who we admire, the most heroic figures who stand for justice and who who speak the truth, they're all flawed. Even the greatest ones, the greatest heroic, heroic figures we can think of. But God alone is holy and he is perfect in all of his ways. And so then on that basis, they prophetically declare that a day is coming when all nations will worship God because his righteous acts have been revealed. It's a prophetic proclamation. And and we see how that plays out later on in the book of Revelation as well, that 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 will come true. One of the things that I find so amazing about this song is that the deeds that these people are talking about are quite clearly God's deeds of judgment, God's acts of judgment. They're also God's acts of salvation, but those two things go together for God, that his judgment and his salvation, just like the picture of the Red Sea, that the Red Sea was God's mighty deliverance of his people, but at the same time, it was his judgment on Egypt, the oppressor. Egypt, the, the represented by Pharaoh, who hardened his heart against God, who refused to recognize God, and who wanted to take on and cap, take captive and enslave the people of God permanently against the will of God. The, the, the evil and wicked oppressor, God judges them and God delivers his people at the same time. That's how, that's how God works in his judgments, that pattern. So don't you sometimes hear people ask questions about God's judgments? Like people say, how can a loving God um, send people to hell? Or how can a loving God judge people and uh, be against them? How can, how is that compatible with love? How is that fair? And how can I worship a God who is going to do all these judgments and things like that? Don't people say that all the time? And what the suggestion is in those thoughts is there must be something wrong with God. And I must know better than God what's fair and just and right. And I'm going to judge God because if God is doing these judgments, then there must be something wrong with him and I must have a better idea of what's just and fair and right than God. I just want to ask you, how likely do you think that is? That your idea of justice and of what would be just and fair and true is um, better than God's idea of what's just and fair and true? (laughs) 0% probability? Something like that, okay? It's just not the case. And so I find this passage massively comforting because I honestly don't know how to take in some of the information about God's judgments. I don't know how this is going to be uh, perfectly fair, and I don't know all the details of how God is going to judge each person. But what I know is that it is going to be fair It's going to be much more fair and just and true than anything you or I would ever think in terms of a judgment or a fairness or a distribution. God is never does anything that's unfair. God's principles are perfectly righteous and just. And part of how I know this is because the people who see what he's doing and they see the fullness of it and they're standing there at the end and they see everything that God is doing and they don't go, they don't go in their song, God, this is a little bit too much. God, I think you got a bit of a mistake here. This guy, is this really necessary, God? I'm not sure that this is... That's not what their song is about. They're seeing what God is doing and they're perceiving in it the perfect justice and rightness of all that God is doing. And no one who is in the time of God's judgment will be able to look at it honestly, and say that's in any way unfair or unjust or not right. And to me, that's enough. I don't have to understand it perfectly myself. I don't have to go and stand in the, and, and know all the details and think about who God is judging and how he's judging and what about their hearts and what about what's going on. It's not up to me. It's up to God, and he's going to judge fairly. 
And to me, that's enough to give praise to God. And our heart should be in line with these saints who are thinking about God's judgments and come to the point where we praise God for his judgments. Well, how can we do that? Well, we have to understand a little bit about his judgments to be able to, I think, have, have the freedom to say, God, I praise you, I thank you, and I, I cry out and I long for your judgments to come. I delight in your judgments, not only in your salvation, but in your judgments. How can we, how can we do that? Um, okay, well, let's look at what's going on next, okay? So after this song, uh, we, we resume what started out in verse 1, that the bold judgments are, are proceeding out, okay? It says, after this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. Okay? So, let's think about this a little bit. Um, Where are the judgments coming from? They're coming from the innermost sanctuary of the temple of God. Okay? These angels uh, representing God, and they're described in a way that's very close to how Jesus is described in chapter 1. So that indicates to me that they are representing Jesus. They are, they're in a close connection and, and proximity to Jesus. They're coming out of the temple, the innermost sanctuary of the witness, uh, the, temp, the tent of witness in heaven, the heavenly temple, the most holy place in heaven. And that speaks that God has commissioned these judgments, that they are decided upon by God, and he's commissioned these angels to carry them out. Okay, so... The sanctuary of the tent of witness. I want to think about that just a little bit here. Because what is that? Um, the, sanct- the tent of witness. So the most holy place um, contained inside of it the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant of God. And we actually noticed in chapter 11, verse 19, around the time of the seventh trumpet, a similar thing was spoken, that the temple of God was opened And inside the temple, you could see, you could get a glimpse of the Ark of the Covenant. And what it speaks to is God's eternal covenant, his eternal faithfulness to his promises and to his people. That's the meaning of the Ark of the Covenant. God's eternal faithfulness to his his testimony, the testimony that he's given to his people. And he is faithful to that testimony It's the testimony of God's great love for his people, and it's also the testimony of his great love for all human beings. And I just want to suggest that the the judgments of God proceed out from the heart of God, which is love. We know that God's heart is love. And, okay, this is a concept that I've thought about many times over the years, and it kind of blows my mind. I hope it's helpful to you. We can, of course, talk about this later if things are not totally making sense. But the wrath of God is just another facet of God's love. The the wrath of God is not a distinct thing from God's love. In in God, they're, they're one. They're united. And the wrath is a necessary component and feature of God's love. And why might that be the case? Well, you think about God's love and his love for his people and his faithfulness for his people. And he says, I will be their God and they will be my people. And we will be united in love and this purpose. And in spite of all of the sin and the wickedness of my people, I'm willing to forgive them. I'm willing to cover them. I send my own son, Jesus, to pay with his own blood for all the sins, to bring about forgiveness I do everything to make it possible for my people to realize the vision of my heart, which is to live with my people forever and for my people to experience my glory and my fullness and the fullness of life in relationship with me. This is God's purpose in creating the heavens and the earth. This is why we exist, because of this purpose of God, because of this love of God. But when God says that and when God has that purpose, he takes that purpose seriously. It's not a purpose that he goes, 
yeah, well, this is what I kind of hope for, but you know, if it doesn't go that way, whatever, it's okay. And if people don't really like that purpose and they would prefer instead to worship the devil and, and destroy themselves completely and, and ruin themselves and each other, that's all right, fine, that's fine. But you know, I really wish it would be the other way. No, God rejects any opposition to his love. He rejects any opposition to his love to the point that he's just going to burn it up. He's going to completely destroy it. And any, anyone who opposes God's love and goodness and glory and beauty and his love for them. See, when people oppose God, they are essentially opposing themselves because God is 100% for us. So God, when God rejects us, he's rejecting our rejection of his love for us. And that's what, that's what we're doing. When we reject God, we're rejecting ourselves because God is for us. And finally, God says, well, if, if people are going to stand in that hardness of heart against me and against my testimony that I gave to the world through my son, Jesus, through the cross, if people are going to stand against my testimony of my love, for them, then in the end, that opposition to my love is going to be, it's going to be burned up and destroyed. It's going to be annihilated. It's going to be removed. And God's purposes are going to be fulfilled. God's love. God is not going to let evil win the day. He's not going to let people's um, self-condemnation and self-hatred and hatred of each other and violence and depths of of immorality and demonic worship and, and thefts. And he's not going to let that win. He's not going to let that be the end of the story. God is very hard against evil. He will not allow it to stand. That is the purpose of God's judgment. That's the heart of what's going on in God's judgment, that he's saying he is going to finally unmask and remove from the planet Earth every trace of the satanically controlled kingdom of this world from the Earth. And he's going to break the devil's power over the earth completely. All of the deceptions, all of the accusations, all of the falsity, all of the lies, all the destruction, all the murder, all the hate. He's going to completely destroy it. To prepare for the reign of Christ, the rightful king, the king of love. Okay, so... I just wanted to, to say that in this context to talk about the judgments of God. How can people be praising God for his judgments? You have to understand why God's judgments are so important and why God's justice is so important. Otherwise, we become offended and, and the whole world. And we see in this passage two responses to God's outpouring of his judgment. There's the people who see it with a clear vision and with clear and un- uh, hearts free from idolatry and from deception, and they all declare out to God, God, you are, tr you are just and true. And then there's the people whose hearts have been filled with idolatry and delusion and deception and have given in to the beast and have agreed with the beast. And when God brings their judgments on them, they curse God and they blame God. They curse God and they blame God for his judgments and they blaspheme God's name exactly as the Antichrist himself does. That is the ministry of the Antichrist. It is to blaspheme God, to blaspheme his name. And they, those who agree with the, with the Antichrist, who is the king of deception and delusion, who is empowered by Satan himself, who speaks lies when he, when he speaks his native language, he speaks lies against God, and he does it so that people will be destroyed, People who are aligned with them, that's, that's what they're going to say. That's what their going to response is going to be. But the world misunderstands and doesn't see God clearly. And so in the end, they don't, they don't admit the justice and the truth of his ways. But those who see it clearly, they will all know perfectly that it, there is not one iota of injustice or unfairness in God. Not even a single trace of it. So, these angels come out, and they're given by one of the four living creatures seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. And these golden bowls, I believe, appeared earlier in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8, where it talks about um, 
the, the, the ministry of prayer before the, the altar of God, the, the great altar of incense in, in the heavenly temple. And what's being presented in the golden bowls um, in, that, in that prayer service and ministry to God is the prayers of the saints. Revelation 5.8 speaks of golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And then in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3 to 5, we see the same thing, that, that the, the prayers of the saints are, are arising before God's throne like incense. And so these golden bowls now that these angels receive, I, I can't see them as disconnected from these earlier golden bowls. And what that says to me again, that was, which is what we also saw before, is that the judgments of God that God releases on the earth are the outflow of the prayers of God's people and the cry of God's people. See, God's people have been massively oppressed and devastated by this evil and oppressive government that's been operating. And they were crying out, even back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, the souls under the altar are crying out to God, how long, O Lord, until you make this right, until you avenge our blood? How long, O Lord? How long are you going to let this keep going? this evil and oppression and this massive deception and delusion and how long, O oh Lord, are you going to allow this to happen? And God responds to them and he responds to the prayers of the saints. And that's part again of why I say in the end times, I believe the church is going to be a very vibrant and living and praying church. It's not going to be a few people hiding out in like a bomb shelter up in northern Ontario somewhere with a few cans of beans and a bunch of guns, right? That's not what the church is going to be like. They're going to be engaging in a ministry of prayer. The incense is going to be ascending up to heaven. They're going to be participating. They're going to be, their hearts are going to be aligned with all of God's purposes and they're going to be crying out for God's justice to come. They're be crying out to Jesus to come. And make it right. Come, Lord Jesus. That's going to be their cry. And they're going to be prophetically witnessing with great boldness and strength, even in the midst of all that's going on with the Antichrist. Amen? Isn't that a better picture of the church than than it's kind of like everyone's like cowering under these rocks, like a few handful of people over here and opening their little cans of beans that they saved up for the end times, right? I don't know. Sometimes that's how people think about it, right? I mean, it's going to be a massive persecution, but it's also going to be a massive response of prophetic outpouring, like what it says in Joel, that in the last days, I'm going to pour out my spirit in all flesh, and they're going to prophesy, and they're all going to prophesy from the least to the greatest, and even the whoever they are, they're all going to be prophesying. So I think there's a glorious, I really think the end times in the book of Revelation is not meant to scare the, the people of God at all. So if we're reading the book of Revelation and we're, we're scared, yeah, there's like really intense stuff coming, but it's not meant to scare us. It's meant to make us cry out and sing to God and praise God and cry out and long for this stuff that's coming. Because God's going to make it right. Okay, so it says that the sanctuary was filled in verse 8. The sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. So the, the greatness of God, the unapproachability of God, the, the uniqueness of God, on the pain of death, even the greatest heavenly creatures couldn't go into that, the temple during that time because of the greatness of the power of God that's being released. Just the glory of God and the smoke that's filling the temple like like it was in when Isaiah saw God in in Isaiah chapter 6. Okay, so that's the introduction to the bowls in chapter 15. And chapter 16 actually talks about the content of the bowls and what happens. And it starts out, so I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through this. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple. So who's the loud voice from the temple? It's got to be God because nobody else can even go in the temple during this time. But this loud voice tells the seven angels... Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. It's a clear, decisive, authoritative command to release these plagues according to God's perfect timing and sovereign plan directed against the earth, against the planet earth. And the reason it's directed against the earth is because 
in this, in this time, the earth is completely under siege by the devil and by the Antichrist and by his kingdom. And God is breaking off the power of its captors and oppressors on the earth and in the heavenly realms completely. That's what God is about to do. So how does he do it? The first angel goes and pours out his bowl on the earth and harmful and painful sores come upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Okay? There's a bunch of things here. The, the bowl judgments, just like the trumpet judgments, are modeled on the Exodus plagues. I mean, they're very related to the Exodus plagues. So that, that theme is meant to be, we're meant to be resonating with that all the way through here of God's great deliverance against the end time Egypt and the end time Pharaoh. And <clears throat> so a lot of these, the sores and the darkness and the blood and all these things uh, are, are things that happen upon Egypt, but now it's, it's pictured at a global scale because the Antichrist uh, dominion has this global... Uh, global dimension to it. Okay, so it's clear from the outset that these plagues are directed against the beast and his kingdom and his followers. They're not directed against the saints. So again, if people are kind of imagining the, the great tribulation at the end and all these things and, and the saint, as if the saints were being targeted by these judges, they're not. God is judging the oppressors of his people in, in the Antichrist kingdom. These are people whose hearts have been, at this point, permanently hardened against God. It's equivalent to the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. These are not people who have any chance of, of repenting left. There is no chance of repenting. These judgments are not directed against them to, pr to provoke their repentance, as I believe the things that are happening in the seals and even the trumpet judgments because some of the response to the trumpet judgments are that people repent. I mean, people turn and give God glory, at least it says, which sounds to be like repentance. They're turning to God. But in these ones, no one repents. This is a judgment against people who have made their decision and their commitment to be against God to the point and the depth of receiving the mark of the beast, and there is no going back for them. And that's, that's who is receiving these plagues at this point. Um, <clears throat> okay, the second angel pours out his bowl into the sea. And the sea becomes like the blood of a corpse, the entire sea. And every living thing in the sea dies. I don't even know how to imagine that happening. I mean, the sea is, the seas are, are vast of the earth, right? Turning into blood and everything dying. Okay? What's going on here, I believe, is that, and, and we'll see it more in chapter 17 and 18, but the, the Babylon, the great city, of the earth and the Antichrist empire um, relied a lot on international trade and sort of maritime sea routes. And so what God is doing, he's systematically taking out every aspect of the Antichrist kingdom. And so taking out the sea is a huge part of that. And we'll see that in chapter 17 and 18 and all the people, all the merchants and the people who depended on this Antichrist system are, are wailing because of what's happened in the sea and all, all the sea trade and stuff has been, been devastated. And then the third angel pours out his bowl into the rivers and springs of water. This is the source of drinking water, okay? So all of the sources of, of fresh, clean drinking water is now destroyed, is, is turned into blood. Uh, it's rendered undrinkable. And at this point, there's an angelic commentary in chapter 16, verse 5. The angel in charge of the water says, just and, and just are you, just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Okay? So these are all people who agreed and consented to the death of God's people. To the, because this is what the Antichrist was doing. And they said, yes, we're aligned with you. We support you. We wholeheartedly support. We agree with this. We're participating in this, in the death of the saints and the prophets of God. And so the angel says, now you're turning their drinking water into blood. They poured out all this blood, and now you have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. So one of the things that we can see here in God's judgment is that it follows this principle. God does not do or give or dole out any judgment beyond what is truly deserved. 
He doesn't go beyond that boundary ever. And he treats people according to the way that they treat others. Which I think is just an amazing part of God's judgment. So when God brings his judgment, it's just visiting the intention and the desires of what evil people wanted to do to other people back on themselves. And it's kind of like the point, if you think it's okay to treat other people like that, how can you possibly complain when that exact treatment is, is visited back upon you? It's God's perfect judgment. His perfect justice. Um, another element of God's justice, again, is that God, in exercising justice, his, his position is always to destroy the oppressor, to destroy the proud, to bring down the proud and the oppressor, and to liberate the oppressed, and to raise up and exalt the humble. I think you could say even from this, I mean, which one is worse? To have to drink blood or to have your blood poured out of your body? <laughs> right? It's, it's worse. So in a way, I think there's even God's mercy here. That God visits upon them the judgment. It's not even as bad. It's proportionate. It reflects the same evil will and intention that they had, but it's not even as bad as what they did. The judgment that they receive. God is not, no one is going to tell God that he's unfair. No one's going to be right about that. Anyway, okay, so then um, in response to this angel, angelic declaration, the altar, the souls that are under the altar, they respond and they say, yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. And so here's another aspect of the judgment of God that we see here is those very people, see these souls under the altar, they're the ones who were killed. They're the ones who were suffered, who uh, were martyred, who were tortured, who were beheaded. They are the ones who received the brunt of the Antichrist oppression. And they see now how God is responding to that. And they say, yes, Lord, that is enough. That is a completely fair, that is a complete vindication of everything that we had to be justly vindicated. It's true and just what they're receiving. The fourth angel pours out his bowl on the sun and the sun is allowed to scorch people with fire. They're scorched by the fierce heat. I don't know what this is going to be like. I mean, I just imagine it, you know, like the sun, like some kind of crazy solar flares that are coming out of the sun and just scorching people on the earth. I mean, the sun is sometimes really hot and burning already, which we're going to experience today a little bit. But I don't think it's just talking about that. It's not just getting a sunburn. It's massive um, uh, plagues. People are being scorched by this. And, uh, and then what it says is that they cursed the name of God. The people who are being scorched by the sun cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. So again, it just says, this is, this is not the, the point is not to bring about repentance at this point. The point is to judge and remove evil from the earth. <clears throat> God is going to uh, is going to exert such pressure in the end times that everybody's true colors are going to come out. I just feel like right now we're in this time of great mercy, where God is is give, God has been just so patient. I mean, when Peter talks about God's judgment, he says people are saying, "Where is this judgment that everyone speaks about?" They're scoffing. They're saying, "Where is this judgment?" And everything is going on as it always has. There's no second coming. There's no judgment coming. And he says the reason why there's this delay is because of God's patience, because God doesn't want anyone to perish. It's not his will. So he has this great patience that's manifested out. And that's why we experience this delay and this time period where we have the opportunity, where people are being given the opportunity to repent and to turn. But as the, as the end comes closer, the pressure that God puts on people becomes greater and greater and their real commitment and their real self. Are they for Jesus or against Jesus? Are they for the Antichrist or are they faithful to Jesus? It's going to come out and there's not going to be any more waffling and sitting on the fence and kind of being a half-hearted, well, yeah, I kind of like Jesus, but I don't really like Jesus and I'm not really into this, but I'm kind of into it, but not really. No, there's not going to be any more room for that. It's going to be, it's going to be an either art or choice that people have to make. And so these people who are taking the mark of the beast 
all that's going to be left for them is, at, at this point, when they've hardened their hearts to this extent, is, is to be destroyed, to be removed from the earth. And all they can do is cry out in anger because they've, they have so sold themselves out to evil. All they can do is curse God. The fifth angel pours out his, his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom is plunged into darkness. Just like what happened to, to Egypt, right? The darkness that was, that was over the land of Egypt in the, in the plagues. I think this is the destruction of the power infrastructure of the Antichrist kingdom that the sources of power and, you know, electricity and light is totally taken out. It's poured out onto the throne of the beast, right onto the throne of the beast. And so this is, this is the great standoff because the beast is basically saying, like, that he is God and that he can take on God and he's made all these boasts against God and now God is showing him up for who he really is and that he really has no power and God pours out this bowl and his entire kingdom is plunged into darkness. This is, a, this is the seat of government. And then there's a general comment that people are gnawing their tongues in anguish and cursing the God of heaven for their pain and sores. So it shows that their pain and sores, which was from the first plague, they're still experiencing these. And these judgments are coming, in my mind, in rapid succession. They're coming one after the other, maybe in a period of about a month, that these, these judgments come against the Antichrist in this great finality. And they didn't repent of their deeds. And we remember what their deeds were. Their deeds were murder, um, idolatry, sorcery, and theft as a, as a summary of the essence of what they were doing. But they didn't repent of their deeds. The sixth angel pours out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. Now, this is a little bit, what? Like, the river Euphrates? Like, oh, everything else seemed to be so global and everything like that. But what's happening here is this is the great gathering of the kings of the earth to the great day of of God's battle. And this is going to be a big theme in the rest of Revelation that comes comes along here. So I'm not going to talk about it in a lot of detail today. But what happens is it says, I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. And I don't know why they're like frogs, but there were frog plagues in Egypt. And there's also like, there, it's like the croaking of these frogs, you know, they're like this kind of creepy croaking spirits. Anyway, it says clearly that they are demonic spirits. They're performing signs. They go abroad to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God, the Almighty. And this, as we know, in just a, a verse, a couple verses later, it's, uh, this is Armageddon. So everyone knows Armageddon from the pop culture, right? Our battle, everyone talks about Armageddon. The, you know, and we think of like these great massive storms and all this kind of stuff that, that we see in the movies and stuff, right? But this is, this is the original Armageddon. And what's being talked about here is this massive deception that goes across the earth. And you really have to think about this. Because think about it. If Jesus is in the sky, okay, the sign of the Son of Man has appeared in the sky. He's come down to that level and he's, he's moving across the earth and every eye will see him. It says, every eye will see him in the sky. That's why Jesus said, like, don't go after these false Christs because when I come, it's going to be really obvious. Like, I'm going to be in the sky and it's going to be visible just like lightning is visible when it's from one end of the earth to the other. It's not going to be a, a, right? Jesus is like, don't go into the, if someone tells you, hey, hey, come into this little room over here because Jesus is here. It's Jesus' second coming in this room. And you're like, no, it's not, okay? Jesus is going to be seen across the entire earth. There, I'm not, it's not a joke. There, have, there are all these cults and weird, there's so many false Christs that you can see about that ex, it's, ex, it's very much like that. It's like, hey, there's this guy in this room and it's Jesus. And you're like, no. It's not Jesus. That's not how Jesus comes again. Okay? But think about how the world, which is opposed to Jesus and which hates Jesus and is under the dominion, has been worshiping Satan and worshiping the beast and fully aligning with all of his blasphemous words against God and against everything. And now Jesus appears in the sky. How are they going to respond? And these demonic spirits go out to deceive people in the final great deception to think that they can kill Jesus. Basically, that's their response, is they're like, let's get all the armies of the earth together 
and we're going to fight Jesus. And it's like, good luck. Good luck fighting Jesus. But they think that it's going to work. And they literally gather, they assemble. And, you know, I don't know, I think, I take it as literally as I can. So I take it as the plain of Megiddo. Right? Which is, where is that? That's like a little bit north of Jerusalem. A couple days journey north of Jerusalem, something like that. The plain of, of Megiddo. Armageddon. Near Mount Car- Carmel. Near Mount, yeah, it's near Mount Carmel, right? And there's a big plain there. And historically, there have been these great battles against Israel where God brought about this, this great deliverance uh, from pe- much, much more powerful uh, enemy nations. But it's this big plain and uh, it says they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now, right in the middle of this, in verse 15, all of a sudden we get this saying of Jesus from the Gospels. He, it, it's, and in, if you've got a red letter Bible, it's in red letters. And it's Jesus talking all of a sudden. Like, right in the middle of this. Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him, so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. And you're like, why is that there all of a sudden? Um, Well, you know, the reason I think that's there, and this is, I'm going to say it's a little bit speculative, but I think it makes good sense of it, is that a lot of times when people talk about the end times, they go, well, nobody knows the day or the hour, so I guess, you know, it could be tomorrow. Uh, For all we know, it could be happening later this afternoon. Jesus will come again, right? Because nobody knows the day or the hour. And... I don't think that's a properly biblical approach to this. Because although we don't know the day or the hour, see, a day is a very small slice of time, and the hour is a very small slice of time. No one knows the exact day or the hour. But what we do know from Jesus is the signs of the times and the seasons, and Jesus talked about that, and he wants us to be aware of that. And what we see in Revelation is a a three-and-a-half-year period of time that is emphasized again and again. And there's a clear discussion of from the time when the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple, from the time of that statue being set up of the Antichrist, until basically the end is somewhere between 1260 to 1335 days based on Daniel and what's in in Revelation. So it's a span of a couple months. But actually, it's not even, it's even more precise than that. I I think that once that happens, the day that that uh, image is set up in the temple in Jerusalem, will be like, okay, 1260 days. After 1260 days, we know like a big deal is going to happen. But the trumpet, the seventh trumpet that blows at the end of that, might blow over a period of days. So we don't know exactly the day. But when these great events and these great deceptions are happening, that's when Jesus is going to come. Here's another way to think about it. If Jesus is traveling in the sky around the earth, like riding on a cloud of some kind, and he's making himself visible to all the people on the earth, well, you know, you don't know exactly when he's going to come to your part of the world. Because he's, I think he's traveling over the entire earth. Over the, over the whole globe. So it's like, why is this in here right at this moment? I think it's because Jesus is saying, that's where this really applies. That you don't know the exact day or the hour, and you better be ready in this time. Because I'm coming, and I'm going to really be there at this time. And you want to be ready. But it's not like all throughout history, it could have been any day, and it's just going to be like a surprise out of nowhere. No, the Antichrist has to come. There's a three and a half year period. There's a whole bunch of signs of the times that Jesus speaks about. Those things have to happen first, before Jesus comes. Anyway, that's my take on that. And I just wanted to say that as part of our Revelation series, because I know still some people have that approach, right? And a lot of people say this, and I'm not saying that it's, you know, I think there's some reason why people say this, but, but this idea that it really could be literally like any, like it could be 4 p.m. today. No, it, it can't be because there's still some signs of the end that we haven't seen unfold yet. And, you know, we need to see it in the context and be aware of that. Okay, um, so we're at the seventh angel, uh, pours out his bowl 
into the air, and a loud voice comes from the temple from the throne saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. So that's how the the action section of the bowls ends um, with this massive earthquake. That basically, um, the the great city I think has got to be like the capital of the Babylon um, Antichrist Empire at that point. And I, I think it might be Jerusalem. I don't know for a hundred percent sure, but I mean that's where the temple of God is with the image of the beast in it. And um, I, I don't know, okay. But that city, the great city, I think the capital of that of that Babylonian uh, city the great city that rules over the entire earth, is going to split into three parts and all the cities of the nations are going to collapse. Have you ever been to the cities of the nations? Imagine they collapse. Imagine an earthquake on a global scale that causes the cities to collapse. The reason is that Jesus is coming again to rebuild everything. He's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. And before he gets there, he's going to shake everything that can be shaken. He's going to destroy everything that's of of purely human origin that's not for the glory of God. He's going to take it down and raise it to the bottom so that it can all be restored and rebuilt the way that it's supposed to be. And that's why this great devastation at the end and, and the final finality of God's judgment on Babylon the Great, which we see more about in chapter 17 and 18. So that's the commentary on this action section. So that's what we'll be talking about next time. Uh, we have a Revelation sermon. So that's all I have today. Um, I just want to, I just hope that the Holy Spirit is moving us to praise God for his justice. If we take away anything, to lo- not only praise God for his justice, but to long for his justice, to cry out for his justice, because we understand the heart of it and what he's doing and how it is an essential facet of his love, that God is going to carry out his love and he will not agree with anyone who opposes the greatness of of his love and his glory that he's revealed in Jesus. He will not accept any opposition to that. And the world takes offense at it, and the world curses God's name and blames God for all the things that are going wrong instead of repenting of their sin and blasphemes God rather than repenting. Instead of that, because we probably experience, we probably have traces of that, right? We when things go bad, our first thing is like, why God? Why are you doing this to me? We take offense at God. We take offense at what he's doing and his judgments rather than repenting. So let's repent now while we're still in this period of mercy and not let it get to that point where all that pressure is on and the stakes are so much higher. I mean, the stakes are high now, but we're in this period of God's mercy. We need to repent now. I just tell you a little bit of, this is kind of a funny story, and but I think it shows something, okay? Last night, you know, sometimes I get addicted to these Netflix little TV series. And then I just want to watch them. And I'm kind of like, I'm trying to arrange everything so that I can get to my little Netflix thing and watch the next episode of the series, right? And last night, uh, Jennifer had to go out to get some things. And I was tired after the day. And we just had a guest over and he had gone home. And then I'm like, I'm going to watch my Netflix thing. The instant I pick up my phone to watch Netflix, literally the instant, My baby, who had been sleeping, starts crying. And I'm like, okay. God, are you telling me something about this? I don't know. Maybe it's just a coincidence, right? So I go back. I get the baby settled down. It takes like half an hour. And I finally get back to my room. And I'm like, okay, I'm ready to watch my Netflix thing. And and he's, he's sleeping again. And I turn it on. The instant I press it, he's crying again. I'm like, God, Come on, I just want to watch this Netflix. And God's like, you have to preach on Revelation 15 and 16 tomorrow. You're not even ready. I'm like, God, I just want to watch this Netflix and just relax. And, and then, you know, so I'm like, okay. I was like, I was thinking, should I like, should I test God and do it a third time and see what happens? I was like, I put it down. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do, I'm going to clean up the kitchen because Jennifer's out shopping and I should be nice. And I clean up the kitchen and then, 
and then I get down and I sit down with my revelation notes and I start working on my sermon and there's not a peep out of that baby and he just sleeps through the whole night and you know and I'm like see God is serious and these little times now when we know what he's prompting us to and we know what we should be doing and we're doing it and he's like he's like Holy Spirit is convicting you you should learn how to obey the Holy Spirit now and don't put it off until it gets to this point where this massive pressure because how are you going to stand against the Antichrist if we can't repent at the little convictions of the Holy Spirit right now? You know? We have to take this seriously. And we praise God for his, his judgments and for his mercy. And let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatness of your judgments, even though, Lord, we just admit that we don't understand it and we easily get offended as we think about your judgments, Lord, and we think that there's lots of reasons to accuse you or to think that you're wrong or to think that we know better than you. And we know this whole world is full of just blasphemies of your name and cursing and mockery of you already. That spirit of the Antichrist is is moving with great power in our, our society that we live in. And Lord, help us not to be part of it, Lord. God, have mercy on us, God. Help us to listen to you. Break us out of our complacency, Holy Spirit. Give us mercy so that we can repent as you move us now. Lord, I just confess that I just, I'm so weak. And even without you convicting me, I wouldn't even realize or face up to what I'm doing that I know is wrong. And, and even when you do, I still wouldn't, I wouldn't do anything about it if you didn't give me the grace, Lord. So pour out your grace, Lord, on us, on your people so we can turn from our sin, so we can live as those witnesses who, who conquer the Antichrist by the word of our testimony and by the, by the blood of the Lamb and can give this great witness in the end times, even in the midst of the, the most terrible things that seem to be happening. Lord, we look to you and we trust you and we long for that day. And, and Holy Spirit, as we continue to study Revelation, as we continue to move toward that time in history, we ask that you would Awaken that cry of our hearts, Lord, above every other cry that we would say, Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, and make it right. Come, Lord Jesus, because no human being is going to make it right in this world, and there's nothing on the earth that we can trust uh, compared to you, Lord. Help us not to be discouraged, Lord, but to lift up our heads and give you glory. And God, just awaken us, God even in this hot summer where we feel so lethargic and awaken our spirit, Lord, to come to you and to be alert and awake. And yeah, we just pray that in Jesus' holy name. Amen. 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 Amen.